which has been suddenly taught the Soviet leadership, but also to me and to many others in the world, is just false. And Feynman says the same thing after describing this. Say nobody knows any machinery, nobody can give you a deeper explanation of this phenomenon than I have given. That is the description of it. So the description that I just gave. Well, they can give. Bloom does. Like it, don't like it, I don't care. It doesn't mean it's deep. What? It doesn't mean it's deep. No, but it's deeper than the description. You're not simply describing the phenomenon of interference, etc. You're saying particles are trajectories that uh, reproduce this phenomenon. As I explained this morning, I can explain it today. Now there is something more subtle, in a sense, apparently more subtle, due to Wheeler, John Wheeler, who is a disciple of Bohr in some sense, and he called it the delayed choice experiment, which makes the mystery of interference is even more troubling, at least superficially. What you do, you have the two slit there, and then you have lenses that sort of send the wave. This one will travel there and there to a detector here and there. And if you do that, then there are detectors C1 and C2, and then you see a non-interference pattern at C1, a non-interference pattern at C2. Because you know the wave cross each other, and so there they don't interfere. If one detects a particle on one of those counters, you will be tempted to conclude that the particle went sorry, through the upper state if counter C2 detected. So if you detect it there, you will say it comes from here, and if you detect it there, it comes from here. Okay, that's what we have thought, and it's wrong, but we have to get it. But you can also insert a detection plate, detection plate here in the region where the two wave packets interact, intersect. Intercept here, so you put a play there. And then, of course, you will detect an interference pattern. According to some way of speaking, you say that the particle went through both slits. Okay, that's the way to speak. But you can choose to insert the detection plate after the passage of the beams through the slits. So it looks like you can decide whether the particle went through both slits or through only one of them by inserting or not the detection plate after the particle had supposedly decided to go through one fit or not. That's the basis of the claim what we got, that the pass is not really the pass and then until it has been registered. <coughs> so you are backward causation. You are acting on the pass by doing this. Uh, well, you already realize there's something fishy. And of course, if you understood the talk about bromine mechanics this morning, then of course, you can understand why this is not true. But that's what he said, yes. Sorry, but it, it's only backward causation if you have a realistic interpretation. Because, I mean, it, I, I just want to make that point here. So you no, don't he, he certainly, certainly, certainly uh, Wheeler didn't have much of a realistic interpretation. Yeah, exactly. So he, 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 Wheeler didn't say there was backward causation, right? Yeah, he said the past is not the past before you measure it. So the past doesn't exist before you measure it yeah. now. Yeah, I, I think for Wheeler it was exactly the point that you had here, some mysterious way of actually influencing the past because you could uh, uh, influence whether it was a particle or whether it was a wave, whether it went through one slit mm -hmm. or through both slits. That's what he said, because you put that later. You see, you look at these things coming and then you choose. You yeah. put your plate. But, but what was the conclusion that it's, it's not one of them, it's not really one of them? It's both of them, so you can't describe the reality to either one of them. Oh well, no, because we are thought that the particles go to one slit if one slit is open, only one slit is open, or the other, etc. No, no, I believe that. So we thought that they go to both slit. Use the conventional language. We'll see. Yeah, but, I mean, that's very nicely explaining in all the lectures, but. Is, is this picture for Wheeler? Because in his paper, there are kind of seven different versions or few, but I don't remember this one. This is Ronald who talks about this version. This is this picture from Wheeler? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't oh, it's know. you. Uh, what? Because usually the yeah, you just experiment is my center, and, take, and you take no, no, this I mean, picture. I will get to my, my center in a minute. But th this one, it's it's on a paper by Wheeler, or no, it's no, your no, interpretation? It's in, in my book, it's probably done by a friend of mine. I don't know. I have to remember. I have to find where it is. But I don't know where. It's probably an American uh, a picture drawn by somebody. 
I think Bell has a similar picture. Or maybe Bell, no, Bell has a similar picture like that. Bell has a, has a paper uh, in which he discusses this delay choice experiment. He does, it's exactly that picture. In this way. In this way, yes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, maybe the picture doesn't come for copyright reasons from this, and it's, got, it's done by somebody else, but it's exactly the same picture. Now you're right, I don't know. Okay. So now Lila invented an ingenious scheme where such experiments will not take place in the laboratory on a co cosmic scale. Lights sent by distant quasars can pass on either side of a galaxy. The experiment here concerns photons instead of electrons, but the phenomena are similar in both cases. The two sides of the galaxy are like the two slits. Then when the photon reaches the Earth, you can either put some equivalent of the detection plate or not put it. If you do not put it, you can detect on which side of the galaxy the light went, and if we do put it, we can observe that it went on both sides at once. So now you're not only influencing the past in, in, a, you know, in the laboratory, but millions or billions of years ago. Could decide now by choosing which kind of experiment to the first form of light coming from distant quasars, what happened billions of years ago. The choices we are making now not only create reality, but also create the past. If this were true, it would give us human a more fantastic role in nature than what most of science fiction can imagine. Okay? So that's really strange. Okay, so now we're going to the Mazender interference. I will assume that you accept that you have two directions of spin. Uh, Matthias spoke of Z and X, so let's create Z and X direction. I call it one and two. And uh, you have uh, this, uh, uh, my experiments are even more abstract and uh, you know, schematic than Matthias. So my experiment here is just, a I always have boxes. And in the box, you can sort of send particles which are two up or two down. And then in that box, they split into two, uh, you know, they follow two different paths, at least assuming they follow paths, of course. The wave function follows those paths, and then it's reflected there, there, then it's recombined here, and here there is a box that measures the spin direction one. So one box does it in direction two, let's say the x direction, this is in the z direction, or vice versa, never mind. So here you have two paths. One for the particles that are two in the direction up, and this part in the direction two who are down. And if you feed the box with particles that are two up, of course they will all go in that path and there will be none along that path. So that's a good. And then when you recombine them, you will measure the spin direction one, and you will find 50% up, 50% down, which is exactly what Max has explained to us. If you take particles which are uh, spin direction two, then if you measure in direction one, it's 50-50. If you take spin in the, in the alien state of direction one, and you measure in direction two, again, you get 50-50. What is two means? Two, uh, z, and one is x. Mm -hmm. Spin, x or alien state. Alien state of spin. So yeah, so it's, there are two boxes, and the right-hand side box is called box number one, and left-hand side box number two. And the right and right eigenstates of box number two, two are called two up or two down, and eigenstates of box number one are called one up and one down. This measures the spin direction two, because then you feed guys who are already two up, so they all go in this direction. And then there you recombine the wave function, because the other is nothing. But then, of course, we measure in direction one, and then we get 50% one up and one down. Just spin the quantum mechanics. It doesn't look like Stengerler. Like Max Zender, it looks like Stengerler or something. Well, the Max Zender is the recombination there. That's what I well, the, the box two doesn't have another degree of freedom. The, the left box is the, the, the beam splitter, the, the glass plate. But it, Max Zender doesn't have another degree of freedom. It's not Max Zender if you put. No, the spin is just a, a label here for, for the two different paths. There's no spin here. It's really just a, a position. It's just a path that it can follow. But uh, also, the so you cannot just, have one in and two out. No, it's it's two in. Not, if you know, of course, if you put two in, then here when you measure one, half of the time it will go up, half of the time it will go down. No. Yeah, not maybe, 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 no, maybe, maybe John, you need to write that word that two up is one up plus one down. Yeah, sure. I will come here, to can, that. Can you write that word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
like it, so thank you. maybe that makes it uh, then easier to follow. Two up is the name of the state? Yes. Yeah. Pass, it's one of the paths is two up and the other path is two down. The path for the by particles. I mean, I'm just doing, doing TCD experiments just to show that if you put two up, then it will follow one path, and if you start it with two down, then it will follow the other path. That's all. There's nothing strange with that. You have a beam splitter, if you wish, which is splitting the beam into those for one path or the other, depending on how the speed is. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm... But the, 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 my problem with this picture, when I try to put a time reversal, um, then I have to, one more pass to enter, and we don't show it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Usually all these things have two in, two, two pass in, two pass out, and in this picture it's not very clear. Anyway, I don't okay, know. Okay, that's the problem. because the two parts are here. Maybe the two parts... And also uh, here are the same, but it's... Okay, now start with one down or one up. Then you will have 50% going one path and 50% going the other path. And that's something with Matthias explained, that if you recombine them here and then measure in the direction one, you will uh, get 100% going down and 0% going down. Okay? There you have 50-50, because you get pure two, and there you get two and two, but this recombination will make sure that the particles are again down. I mean, so far, I mean, the, I'm bothered because so far there's nothing surprising. Now, the thing which is the delayed choice, if you wish, it can insert a wall there, then what happens? Well, first of all, you will get there, they take 50% fewer particles, because one out of two particles will just be blocked. After box one, the paradox, or the apparent paradox, is after box one, 100% of those who took the path to up are one down, because they start with one down. And here, you see 100% are one down, even those that took this path. So you would say that putting a wall there should not affect the particle who took this path. And of course, the same for the other path, if you have put the wall over there. So if you block th that path, Intuitively, you would say it cannot affect the particles that take two spots out of the remaining. So you have 100% of one down, what you started with, and which you have in this situation, whatever part you choose, you get one down, uh, out of the remaining 50%. But actually, when you do the measurement, you get 25% up, down, and 25. I say 25 because that's half of 50, okay? You already got to of 50. So you act on a certain way of the particles that take one path by blocking the path that they do not take. But that's like the double slit if you wish. It's just sharper because instead of interference pattern you get numbers like 25 to 50, etc. Okay? So this is an apparent dead end. You go to the experiment without the wall and some particles which are one down, what does each particle do? Does it take the path to up? No, because if it did, you would have 25% at the box one, as we see when one puts a wall blocking the path two down, if you block the end. But here you don't get half, you get uh, 100%. The path two down, no, for the same reason. Both paths, no, because you always find a particle along one of the paths if one tries to measure it. If you want to see where the particle is, you can always find it on one of those two paths. Neither of the paths, no, because if both, pla both paths are not then the detection happened at the box on the right. So that's the apparent complication. So this, seminar, this phenomenon is similar to what happened in the first thing, because whether one path is open or not seems to influence the behavior of the particle following the other path. Okay? This is the essence of what I call the first one to mystery, the second being on the character which I explained tomorrow. Again, these experiments are done particle by particle, so there is no explanation based on interaction. And then, of course, people again have this confused way of saying that the particles follow both paths if they are both open, and only one part of them is blocked. But how does the particle know ahead of time whether both paths are open or not? And you can do a delayed choice version. 
That is, you put the wall after the passage of the particle through the box two, measuring direction two, then you can think that the paths are very long, or put the wall just before here, okay? And then you can do the delete, show this again. And you can do another thing, you could remove the box there, let the particle, just like in the, you know, the delay choice, you let the particle continue their trajectory and put detectors one in direction one here, and then you would get 25% uh, in each direction of both detectors. You would have no, no uh, so instead of having, you know, uh, half and half, I mean, sorry, Instead of having 100% there, you would get 50% uh, 50 here, 50% here. Of course, it's 25% because each box will have 25, 50% of the box. The analysis of the young in classical optics. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And under the tender experiments? This yeah. is done with particles, with spin, particles, with quantum particles. It's not done with classical I don't know anything about okay. classical optics. The experiment can be done with ordinary light, yes. Yeah. yeah, but it's not classical optics, it's quantum. There is something quantum in that definitely. <laughs> this is typically a sort of experiment you can't explain classically. So they continue up and upward and downward, and if we then measure the spin, then you get half and half. Uh, so then that's something which you may explain or not, but I want to mention it because I think it's very clever. You can do the little Brightman bomb testing mechanism. Suppose you have a stock of bomb, some of which are active and some of which are dots. The dots are not active. They don't react to anything. You want to find out which is which, but an active bomb will explode if it is hit by only one particle. On the other hand, the dot is totally insensitive to being hurt by one or more particle. It doesn't affect those particles in any way. The question is, how could you tell by classical mean which bombs are active and without exploding them, since they will explode when you touch them with one photon? Of course, there seems to be no way to do that. But then it's an exercise, not an exercise. There is a based on Alexander interferometer that allows to identify at least a fraction of the active bomb as being active without exploding them. So that's pretty clever. So whenever it's describing the appendix of this lecture. So now let's go to the Copenhagen view, at least what I think is the Copenhagen view. Maybe this is just standard <laughs> quantum mechanics, which I'm not sure. You know, I, I think it's useful to remind you of what it means. It's of course in Matthias lecture too. Well, uh, of course it's never clear to me what orthodox quantum mechanics mean. The minimalist interpretation is that it gives room to predict results of measurement. And I think if you want to go beyond that, you really get into some sort of indefinite or confused things. So the states are represented by vectors in C2. So one up would be this. These are the two vector vectors of the sigma z matrix that Matthias mentioned, and these are the two vectors of the sigma x matrix. And then, of course, as I wrote there, you know, uh, actually it was uh, two up was like that. So it's a sum of those guys, two down the difference, one up is the sum, one down is the difference, so you can express each of them as a function of the other. So how does the max Zender interferometer work for that? You send the particles which are one up, the two splits into, wave, the wave function there splits into two parts, one carrying the spin down part, which goes in this part, spin up, spin in this part, and then here, so at T1, let's say, one down is a sum of two up and two down, and then that splits the, the particles, and at T3 and two, T2 and T3, namely here and there, you have the particle up following the path two up, this path, <coughs> minus two down following that path down. These are the wave functions. The wave function are represented by, by this little disk, and you think of them as a moving in time. Okay? The, the disk are the support of the wave function moving along the corresponding paths. At T4, what happens is you recombine the wave function so that you 
the gamma heating follows the path which I indicate by this arrow, namely this path. But then, of course, since you get the same path now for two paths of the wave function, the two, the two spin path, you can sort of pull out that wave function and have for the spin path this sum, which is just one down. Okay? And that means that if you measure the spin one there, you get 100% down because that's what you get. Okay? So this is explained why there is so-called the memory of the initial state. Even though everywhere here, if you measure the spin in the, in the two direction here, you will find two up and two down. And if you measure it in the one direction, you will get something 50-50, you recover the 100% there. Okay? Just standard quantum mechanics, but it's good to explain that. Now, if you block part two, well, it's not a measurement maybe, but it will collapse the state in the sense that after the wall, the state will be, now the state will be only that. So it will be part two up times the spin two up. When you recombine things, the lattice guy is no longer there. And then what you get, of course, two up is now one up plus one down times the path going in that direction. And now if you measure in the one direction, since you have a superposition of up and down, you get half up and half down, which since you have only half of the particle, it's what I call 25-25% up and down. Okay? So you see the whole uh, essential role of measurement, or at least the interaction being the wall blocking the path. And in quantum, only quantum mechanics or Copenhagen, that's it. There is nothing more to be said. We just predict results of measurement. And that's what, what science is about. We don't have to think about trajectories or other, other quantum reality beyond what is directly observable. Exercise. Understand that science needs to figure out how these experiments work. That's a philosophical exercise. And I think I have time to explain that. Einstein explained that to Heisenberg in 1926, and that's recounted by Heisenberg himself in the book called Encounters with Physicists or something. So Heisenberg, that's Einstein speaking to Heisenberg, but recounted by Heisenberg. It is quite wrong to try to find material observable magnitudes alone. In reality, the very opposite happens. It is the theory which decides what we can observe. You must appreciate that observation is a very complicated process. The phenomenon of the observation produces certain events in our measuring apparatus. As a result, further processes take place in the apparatus, which eventually, in my complicated path, produce sense impression and help us to fix the effects in our consciousness. Along this whole path, we must be able to, to tell how nature functions before we can claim to have observed anything at all. Only theory, that is knowledge of natural laws, enable us to deduce the underlying phenomena from our sense impression. When we claim that we can observe something new, we nevertheless assume that the existing laws covering the whole path from the phenomenon to our consciousness function in such a way that we can rely upon them and hence speak of observations. When it comes to observation, you behave, you guys and girls, as if everything can be left as it was. That is, as if you could use the old descriptive language. In that case, however, you will also have to say, in a cloud chamber, in a cloud chamber, we can observe the path of an electron. At the same time, you claim that there are no electron paths inside the atom. This is a huge nonsense. So, now the four, the three remaining interpretation or theories, the boy bone, spontaneous collapse, and many others. We saw yesterday, which means this morning, that the boy bone is a theory of matter in motion. Particle follow trajectory are guided by the wave function, whether you measure something or not. So I will, I will not repeat that I said that this morning, and I showed this picture with certain trajectories, and I mentioned the northern line, so I will repeat that, the experiment also. Now I'm going to go to the delay double split experiment in the double bond language. Okay? In the theory, that's very interesting. If a particle goes to the upper state, it will be detected at C2. It goes to the lower state, it will be detected at C1. Contrary to what you might naively believe. Why? Because there is again another line here in the middle of the picture that the particles cannot cross. They bounce back from that 
line of the wave. The wave function evolves as in the figure. The wave function there goes there, the wave function there goes there. Okay? But the particles cannot cross the line, so they bounce back when they hit here at this line, and they switch horses, as we say, so that if the particle goes to the upper state, it starts being guided by the wave function that goes to the upper state, and when both part of the wave function cross, it becomes guided by the wave function that went to the lower state. That's just what the theory tells you. At least the theory tells you something. Wheel of things, and that's very interesting, that one can tell to which street the particle went when there is no detection here in the middle. The upper one if it's detected at C1 and the lower one if it's detected at C2. So you think that if you go to C2, it must come here and there. Okay? This is an instance of to whom can inspect your calls wheel of fallacy. And now I'm quoting Conway. If one assumes that there are no particle trajectories in the quantum world, as one usually does in orthodox quantum mechanics, then it would seem natural to say that there is no fact about which slip the electron went to, given that there was no attempt to detect the, the electron while passing the slip. So that's orthodox. It's very strange in real, because it's very orthodox. On the one hand, it thinks you can tell to which slip the particle went, and on the other hand, the orthodox says there are no particles, there are no parts. Surprising it is then that Wheeler claims that the detection of a far away screen reveals which slit it took. How can anything reveal which slit the electron took if the electron didn't take a slit? Moreover, in a theory where there are trajectories that are very wrong, the particle does go through one slit, and one can tell through which one it is. It went through by looking where it is finally detected, but it is the opposite of Wheeler's conclusion. So Wheeler makes a conclusion which from the point of view of a theory which is more complete than ordinary quantum mechanics, then it's wrong. But within ordinary quantum mechanics, it's meaningless. So it means that's an example of what I call naive realism among orthodox quantum mechanics. They usually introduce a reality while denying that there is such a reality at the same time, if you wish. Anyway, there is no problem whatsoever. So now, what about Mark Zender in the Dubai Bomb theory? Well, you see here I have two particles. One with, I mean, the, okay, the, the little block there are uh, wave functions, and the dots, black dot or white dot, are particles. This is very simplistic. And then the particle will follow this part, will follow this part, and here, since you recombine the wave function, both particles uh, will go to the, you know, to the bottom and be detected as one minus. The particle follows a unique path, but the wave goes through both paths, as in the double set experiment. The particle is always guided by the path of the wave function in the support of which it finds itself. So for that particle only matters this wave function, for that particle only that wave function. But when they recombine, of course, the combined wave function matters, and that's what the one that leads to this design. Now if you block Part two, it will change the wave function because after T3, after the wall, you will get the wave function will be two up. So if there was a particle there, it would be absorbed. But suppose there is no particle there, there's just a wave function. That wave function gets killed, and so the path becomes uh, two up times that path, and is guided by the path in support of which it finds itself. At T4, and then when you arrive here, then you get two up being a sum of one and one up and one down, then when you measure the spin one direction, direction one, you will get half up and half down. So if you combine both waves, you get a different result and we one block one of them. The wave function is physical <coughs> because it's guiding property. It's not simply a probability amplitude. The upshot is that there is no plan whatsoever under the Brel bomb theory with the double slit experiment or the max ender with or without, or with the religious versions of that. There's no problem at all. Now, what happens in the spontaneous collapse and the many more? Now we rely on Tumulka's lecture. By the way, Tumulka's lectures are to be found on his website in the Tübingen, uh, the, I think it's on your personal page in Tübingen, and so are the lecture notes, by the, the, the slides. I hope the slides for tomorrow and Thursday will be put uh, later today, but 
No, they so are already on the on the website for this summer school. So you can find the, my lectures for tomorrow. It's good to look at the lecture, the slides before the talk. Actually, it's maybe even better to uh, take a look at the slides. I don't mind at all if you look at the slides before. Now I should recommend you warmly to read this lecture now because it does discuss, you know, various mathematics, quantum mechanics, and many worlds, GRW. Then, of course, you know, somebody is going to say that I'm not modest enough, but I, I will recommend, of course, making sense of quantum mechanics as a book which at least explains things from the De Bruyne point of view from A to Z. And then, of course, I should mostly recommend the best book on quantum mechanics that has ever been written, which is uh, Speakable and Unspeakable uh, in Quantum Mechanics by Bell. This is just a series of his articles, so it's not a real book. Maybe it's not so easy to read because it's a series of articles. But I must say, of course I knew the stuff before, but when I got this book many years ago, maybe 1990 or something like that, I, I sat with it to the weekend and I didn't lift my eyes from it, so, since I found it so fascinating. What I find absolutely fascinating, and that will be slightly discussed tomorrow, mm -hmm. is that over and over again, Bell says exactly the opposite of what is attributed to him by almost everybody. So it means that everybody who's referring to Bell's result has not opened that book. How can that be? Uh, that's a unbelievable, but it's true. I think Roderick would agree with me that it's true. And people put, I mean, they don't even put Bell. Sometimes they do put Bell. Sometimes they refer to articles by him, which is the opposite Gelman does that. They refer to an article by Bell, and the Gelman is, uh, you know, the greatest, the one of the greatest genius in physics. But he died recently, but you know, and he, he's referring to Bell, and it's exactly the opposite of what Bell says. It's really remarkable. We'll get to that tomorrow. Anyway, so so as I said this morning, I cannot understand the pure wave function ontology. You may think that uh, you're a vector in a Hilbert space, but I am not. So, by the way, there was a mistake this morning again. This is because it was time before. When I say, spoke of that state, you know, this is exactly like the detector that uh, Matthias was talking about, that you start in the ready state and goes up or down. And I say these correspond to the last two pictures in the figure, the pointer pointing upward or downward, this wave function, because I identify those guys with pointers in the real three-dimensional space. But those guys are in principle function defined on a high dimensional space. Well, I call it R3 and now with capital N, where N is the number of particles. On the configuration space of the whole apparatus, which is made of zillions of particles. Okay? And Z may be the center of mass, but these are not at all the same thing, because these functions defined on a whole, on a big phase space, on a big configuration space, cannot be identified readily with something happening in the world in the three-dimensional world, that's what I explained this morning, that I don't think a function can be identified with something in the world. They are not at all the same things. But, since I'm a Pearl Bohmian, I'm an ontology, the pointers are made of particles, so from my point of view, there was no real problem. It was just a shorthand way to speak about the wave function, of the, about the configuration of the particles made, in, made of which the pointer is made. So let us consider spontaneous collapse with an ontology, so meaning something defined on ordinary space, and let it be the matter density one, gr w n. Then psi square of x t is roughly the local density of matter at x and at time t. Well, the formula is a bit more complicated, but if you take one particle, then that's basically it. So there's a continuous matter density, and psi square is just a continuous matter. Forget everything you learn in school about atoms, electrons, and so on is false, you just continuous matter density. Okay? And that's what science school is. So, what happens in GRWM in that picture? The delayed double shot. The delayed uh, uh, double shot. Well, there is half electron going there, half of the matter density, because it's one of psi one is the psi is dividing psi one and psi two. And psi 1 square as, and psi 2 square of the same density, the total density is psi square, the density of an electron, 
So half of an electron goes there, half an electron goes there. And uh, the half electron going through the upper slit goes to C1. So actually it goes there, and C2 goes there. It, it doesn't switch holes like in Bohmian mechanics. It just follows the wave function. OK? And then the probability of a collapse during all this trip is minuscule because it's a single particle. But at C1 and C2, there are detectors, namely macroscopic objects, and collapses are extremely frequent. That's what Rodrigue explained. So let's say that the first collapse occurs at C1. Then the half electron at C2 gets killed, and the full electron appears instantaneously at C1. If you wish the mass density there, jumps continuously there. I'm just telling you that, of course, I think it's weird, but I, I think that's true also about the theory. So you have to appreciate how weird the theory is. Same thing with the Max Zender. There is a half electron following each path, and when they recombine, it becomes a full electron. But now, if you put a wall, then it gets destroyed. You see, but the half. But, but the matter density gets transferred to the half electron on the other part immediately. So this guy disappears, but this matter density gets transferred there. And then it becomes a full electron. But when the wave functions get here and get split into these two pieces, again, you will have a half electron there, a half electron there, and whichever flashes, there are flashes there. These are detectors, so there'll be flashes there. And whoever has the first flash gets the full electron and the other half electron gets is disappeared, OK? Then, of course, in this picture, again, uh, you know, you will have half electron there, half electron there, and wherever the first detection then, oops, it jumps. It can be very far away. I cannot say that I like this picture of half electrons. But remember that I'm a fundamentalist the brain book. But it saves the phenomenon. Because you can't tell from macroscopic observation whether this is true or false. But I think it's a very weak argument in favor of a theory. Now, I don't think this compares with brain in a vat, but I don't know if you have enough philosophy to hear about brain in a vat. You can imagine that you have a brain in a vat, which is connected by various electrodes to <coughs> an evil scientist who gives you all the impression that you have. So there's nothing in the real world. I mean, I'm not. I'm a brain in the back, and I imagine talking to you, but you are not there. I'm just a brain in the back, and somebody is putting electrodes in my brain so that I have the sensation that there is something. Okay? So everything is an illusion. You can think of that. That's a the phenomenon because everything, every observation I make is explained by that theory. I'm not saying this is as bad as that. It's not. But the brain in the back, and there are millions of other arguments. There is a you know, the coin duet thesis and so on. I mean, you can always sort of save a, a theory if you are willing to make assumptions that are sufficiently adopted to, you know, uh, explain whatever you observe that might uh, be counterintuitive or contradictive theory. Okay. So, let me tell you go. Uh, so, what happened to many words? I'm not going to talk about your many words, okay? I'm going to talk about the one with the ontology, which is the Schrödinger many world or SM, there is a continuous matter density given by psi square. It's exactly as before, but there are no collapses. Okay? Uh, yeah, maybe I, I should explain the notation SM. So if GRW M is the GRW theory with matter density ontology, then S, which is for the Schrödinger equation, is just the ordinary Schrödinger time evolution together with the matter density ontology. So that's so the no many worlds theory. And it has a many world aspect. Now, this is the many world theory that I have. I just comment that it's exactly the same many worlds with just additional uh, intermediate uh, okay. uh, concept of this primitive ontology, which is not needed. Yeah, which is needed. Okay, so we don't have to wait. <laughs> now, we like to think about it. And look, at which some point, we, I, I've not left for years, and that uh, and uh, Shelley and so on. So we agree to disagree. Now the students, of course, just have to face the two arguments and decide for themselves, but we are not going to convince each other. So, so I'm just wondering, do you have an additional term in the Schrodinger equation? No. For, so how do you introduce the method, like match density? I define it. That's odd. No, 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 in the Manuel's picture. 
But this is the, this will have an angular well picture. This so the so if you take the usual Schrodinger equation yeah. and say that there is a, matter, a continuous matter density defined by the same equation as Schrodinger had, where you do the sum of all the mass and you integrate them upside square. But now you can see the one particle with a given mass and then basically it's like square. I just want to simplify things because all my experiments are with one particle. Okay? So there is a matter of density. So let's go back to this picture. Then again there is a half electron going to the other side, half electron going to the other one. And then again this guy goes to there, this guy goes to there because it's just a wave function. Okay, it follows the wave function. But since there are no collapses, now the detector has triggered both at C1 and C2. And that gives rise to two worlds, one where the detector C1 is triggered and one where the detector C2 is triggered. When I look at the result, I will see only one detector being triggered, of course. But that's because there are also two eyes, one that sees the detector C1 and one that sees the detector tri C2 triggered. The two eyes I will call my descendants. So there are two copies of me, one in one world and one in the other world. So uh, can the detector uh, see the difference between half an electron and an no, electron? No, no. I'll explain that in a minute. The multiplication of identities holds also for the entire universe. Because of course, me could interact with people and so on, so it has to be, maybe not instantly, but quickly. So now I'm going to quote you, because I like the sentence. The multiplication of eyes have to be taken literally. That's the, uh, that's left. I am an object such as the earth, cat, etc. I is defined at a particular time by a complete description of the state of my body and of my brain. I and Lev do not refer to the same things even though my name is Lev. His name is Lev. At the present moment, there are many different Levs in different worlds, not more one than each world. But it is meaningless to say that now there is another I. I have a particular well-defined past. I correspond to a particular Lev in 2012, but not to a particular level in the future. I correspond to a multitude of lefts in 2022. Okay, that's just to clarify. Right? Okay. Then of course, this framework is, meaning, is meaningless to ask which level in 2022 will I be? I will correspond to them all. Every time I perform a quantum experiment with several possible results, it only seems to me that I obtain a single definite result. But it's not just two doing experiments, there might be experiments somewhere in, uh, in uh, Zagreb or somewhere. Yes? No. <laughs> <laughs> because there are two worlds created. There. No, two worlds created, but I'm in all of them. So yes. for me, nothing happened. I know, I know. All of them. So no, no, but you, no, you get no, no, for you, but yeah. you get multiplied. No. Yes. This I will belong to all of them. The, the, the fact that the world are multiplied, it's not that me are multiplied. No, you are multiplied no, because no, you are multiplied. No, well. no. There are several copies of you, one in each world. No. no. <laughs> There's one copy, you know, in both worlds. But that was the phrase just before. This is just the phrase before. Yes, that's what well, I said. No, the phrase, the phrase before that you were multiplied. Well, you are multiplied. If I will make a measurement which will split no, but my body, I will, there will be different lefts. But if somebody makes a quantum experiment far away, he will not multiply me, he will multiply number of words, but not multiply me, because I will be belong to uh, the same level, belong to ah, okay. both worlds. Okay, so so I will not be multiplied. As long as well, we don't hear about this experiment. No, you will be well, yeah, In the moment, somebody will, of course, then I will move and whatever. Then, then you will be, yes, yeah, okay. Then it will be multiplied. But well, that's what I call multiplied. Then yeah, yeah. But so only okay. until some, uh, if somebody is space-like separated uh, place yeah, yeah, to make yeah, yeah. uh, splitting, it will not uh, act on me. Then he has to come to me and give me a signal. So my body will move, and I will be aware of any, anything like this. Uh, is it possible that the other person might influence this, the, the person over here, like in the many words, this thing? Since they are a part of the same framework, like they are almost same, but like just the interpretation is different. Like we have them, multiple copies of them. So is it possible that the other, the other copy might influence this person, like the results. No, because you see, then you appeal to decoherence, and then you say for macroscopic bodies, wave functions not interfere with each other. So the two matter, there'll be all these matter densities flowing over, but the wave function associated to each of these worlds 
don't interact with each other because of decay events. Because of the Because of decay events. The decay event says that macroscopic wave function cannot interfere with each other. It's a practical so thing which I discussed this morning. Yeah, so I had this in, in, in my lecture as well, that the two wave packets that correspond to macroscopically different states in the wave function of, of macroscopic objects do not overlap anymore uh, for the next 10 to the 100 years. But they stay distorted. So that's decoherence. But it's just sometimes people call decoherence when uh, the system entangled with the environment. And I think you mentioned that we do not need it. No, so we don't need the coherence. When the system is complicated enough, you cannot make interference. You don't need, even if it's completely isolated, the environment doesn't okay. know about this. Uh, so there is no decoherence in the official name of decoherence. Then it, uh, then uh, the splitting happened or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Anyway, so in the framework, of it's meaningless to us, which never probably correspond to all of that. Level of things is particular result things is where what is that cannot be identified only F after this experiment, F before the experiment corresponds to all that obtaining all possible results. Even support of the many world interpretation by Price the Wit admit that this is a bit weird. I still vividly re, re, I still recall vividly the shock I experienced on first encountering this model world concept. The idea that ten to the hundred plus slightly imperfect copies of oneself are constantly splitting into further copies which ultimately become unrecognizable, is not so easy to reconcile with common sense. That's something I hate. But he, he, he's misinterpreted many words and kind of essentially delayed it for many years because uh, his version of many words is completely unacceptable. In his version, words cannot reunite. Really cannot, not in practice. So his many words is really very bad theory. No, but if it's in practice, what's the difference? I mean, he still thinks that there are all these copies of himself in different worlds, and he's right. He says that they cannot... The whole idea of many worlds, we have elegant theory, we have only Schrodinger equation, as it does. He added splitting. There is no splitting in many worlds. No, There's I understand him differently. I understand him differently. I, I thought he was saying, oh, if you just solve the Schrodinger equation, then this is what happens. You have different packets that are macroscopically disjoint, and then they never re reunite because they are so macroscopically disjoint. What, and what, the, what, how it's accepted and I think what is written, that they don't just never reunite because they're macroscopic, they never, because they're different words. This is what's make it many words. Everett before was a relative state, whatever, and he put it words, and these words were separate, really separate. So, so they, they reunite, in principle, you can reunite the word if there is super technology or unbelievable luck. And yes. he avoided this, and then it's, uh, this theory is unacceptable from all points of view. Okay, but that doesn't make any difference for me, I'm, especially because I'm st sticking to the many world with the continuous density. Which it does it the same, the same thing, you just add some, uh, some name which, uh, no, I don't no, know, okay. helps you, we are welcome, but it's the same okay. many words completely. There is no any difference whatsoever with your density, because I, I take the wave function and I calculate this. I don't call it. You, you call it. You. It helps you to connect to your experience. To, to you are you're welcome. It's the same anymore. There's nothing different. There. Okay. Okay. So let me explain. All this exists in a three-dimensional world, but you are able to declare and explain why the two worlds can to coexist without interfering with each other. Okay. But the matter density of each of the detector is one half of what it would be if only one slip was open. And so is the matter density of my descendant and of the rest of the universe because the total matter density remains constant because psi square remains constant and then every world has a psi 1 square, psi 2 square. Since there is nothing in that world, that's the main point, I think, with which one can compare density, it makes no difference. Don't remember, remember that in, the, in this theory, atoms don't exist, it's all a continuous matter density. If you are atoms and you are dividing by two the number of atoms, Eventually, you would be Avogadro's number and nothing would be left. But if I say that I'm a higher density than you, for example, that, you know, that makes sense because we can compare densities, gold scales, etc. But if you speak of the matter density of all of us in a given universe, what do we compare it with? We can't compare it with the other universe because we don't interact with them. So it's all structurally the same. The wave function, you know, the, 
detector and there are just structurally the same, so the matter density being less is not important. But that's an important point. Suppose there is another experiment where the probability of going through the upper slit and being detected that C1 is one third and going through the lower slit and being detected that C2 is two thirds. So actually we can uh, understand that that might it, it might become important if we consider it in terms of uh, the information rather than as a matter density or as a matter. If, if, if we see that thing in terms of the information, like the bits, zeros and ones, if we, if we see that the matter is nothing but information. Yeah, I don't understand that. Information by whom? For whom? For us? Yeah, I mean, just to, just to compute it or just to understand it like in a simpler manner. Yeah, but could could you explain a bit more? How should we think of that? Um, like, so, so I say that uh, the, the matter thing is there. We might not be, uh, that might not be that much significant. But I'm saying if we uh, think it, uh, think about it in terms of the, the information, as an information, as like any matter can be, uh, we, we can understand in terms of information, right? Like zeros and ones and those kind of things. So that's what I'm saying. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure what that, make a difference here. Yeah. Anyway, let me finish because it's almost time. That, I mean, I can't answer your question because I, it's switching to information and there are a lot of discussion of what expressing physical theories in terms of information would mean, etc. I don't think of physics as being about information. I think about <coughs> that is it's a theory about the world. So if it's detected, suppose that one detection will be one term, the other is two term probably. Then my problem is that there will be two worlds again, one with C1 being triggered and copy of me seeing C3 one trigger, and one with C2 being triggered and copy of me seeing C2 being triggered. Now repeat the experiment many times, n times. After one experiment, I have two descendants, four after two experiments, two to the n after n. The problem is that by the law of large number, the vast majority of my descendants will have made a sequence of observation where C1 and C2 are triggered approximately an equal number of times. That's why if you should throw a coin, you have two possibilities, then of course you will always get that number of times, approximately the same. But according to Bond rules, you should observe C1 being triggered a third of the time and C2 being triggered two thirds of the time. Of course, there will be, since every possible sequence of observation occurs, there will be some world in which this will be true. And of course, if it was one half, one half, there will be a world in which uh, you always trigger the up one, C1, you always trigger C2. But these worlds are rare, they are atypical. And now, the typical world will satisfy a rule which is not the Born rule, and therefore, most of my descendants won't see the Born rule, you have to explain why we are in a world where the world will be satisfied, which is going to be rare or all the world. But it's because you have this naive idea that there is, there is the same probability to be found in any world. And this is extremely strange. No. The worlds are different. They have different amplitudes. There is no any reason whatsoever to say that you have the same probability to find myself in this world or this world, because the world has different physical no. uh, physical I know. characteristics. I, know. I, know. I, I, I was just going to answer that. Because there, there was another question. Yeah, it you. was a problem that okay. was the same. So okay. I was going to ask if we could not just create three worlds, in two of which we have the outcome of the one experiment, and in one we have the other outcome. Yeah. So then we would satisfy the one rule. But only for integer probability. Yes. Or the rational no, 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 no,
as the one where C1 is triggered one third of the time, C2 being triggered two thirds of the time. But if having a matter of density one half as opposed to one doesn't make any difference, since there is nothing in the given world with which one can compare it, what difference do these other matter densities make? So it seems to me that the matter density is totally irrelevant to the probabilities. For me, I have descendants, and these descendants have observation, and statistically, most of my descendants see things which are not. It doesn't make sense to speak of probability in a world where everything happens. Okay? It's like if you took, wait, wait, wait. Let me explain my point. Okay, you can answer it. But if you, it doesn't make sense to me if you throw coins and I say that you know every possible result will obtain but in different worlds. Okay? And you throw the coin many, many times. Then it seems to me that you will have the vast majority of world, one half, one half, statistically. Of course, there will be some world where it always head, some world is always tail, some world it's one half, one third head and two third tail, etc. But most world, by the law of large number, will have one half, one half head and tail. But now, if you tell you that the coin is biased and it will uh, fall head one third of the time, uh, tail two third of the time, but in each case there are two worlds, one where you see one third, one world head, and the other where you see tails and it keeps on going, then still the majority of descendants will have seen one half, one half head of tail, even though the den some density or something may be attached to the world and may be different. But the statistics of my observation will be one half, one half, and I don't see what difference it does to me to have a different matter density. Now let me come to the pure wave function of the wave. Then as far as I can see, there is no difference whatsoever between those sequences of world because there is no density unless one assigns a separately an adult fraction weights to different histories of world so that those satisfying the bone rule have the most of the weight. But I don't see what those weights have to do with the actual frequencies of detection at C1 and C2 observed by my descendants, which I just explained most of them we observe one half, one half. So I don't really understand how the mini world approach even saves the phenomena unlike the GRW approach. Because I don't understand how it accounts for the statistics. Now, this is a problem which at least has been recognized by many worlders, more or less from the beginning, since uh, Everett had to assign these weights. And then it's been going on, and maybe uh, I can't go through the possible answer. You know, there have been tremendous about that. But the upshot, it seems to me, that of the three so called realist alternatives to Copenhagen, the by Brown, GRW, and many worlds with the matter density, that the by Brown theory is by far the most reasonable. In particular, in that theory, we can still believe in atoms and in whole electrons. So my objection to many words about the statistic, among other things, of course I found it weird to put it mildly, but let's say that things could be weird. Now for GRW, that's something I discussed with uh, Roderick just before coming. My view is something like this. First of all, GRW was invented by G, Girardi, I mean at least pursued by Girardi, and he admits himself that he did it because he didn't know Bohm and he wanted to solve the measurement problem. In Dobrev Bohm, the measurement problem is solved, so there is no problem. But he apparently either didn't know or didn't appreciate that, so he came up with this thing. Which is not a completion of quantum mechanics, it's another theory, and it can only be true if quantum mechanics itself is false. Since we haven't found any deviation from quantum mechanics in this sense, there is no evidence whatsoever for GRW. So the theory has to be adopted in the sense that you have no evidence that it's a Poisson process that you multiply by Gauche, and etc. Or that you, the parameters that you choose are three of physical parameters. You choose those parameters to avoid being refuted by common technology. Okay? So that's fine with me. I mean, I'm not against it as a model. But then, of course, it gets weirder once you have to either say the continuous matter or flashes and not particle ontology, as in Bohm. That I found very weird. And I think if physicists discovered that there is a violation of quantum mechanics a la GRW, for example, something that would be like what GRW predicts, but you know, which uh, would violate quantum mechanics, then I don't think they would switch to GRW. They would look for another theory, an alternative to modern quantum mechanics, maybe a nonlinear version, or Roderick was explaining to me before, I can't repeat it because I don't understand something that would be like boom with a density or something 
some uh, master equation or something. I mean, they would be they would look for another theory. So I think this is a toy model that makes you think about alternative to quantum mechanics. The double is a conclusion of quantum mechanics. That's different. You see, that's the difference between So, you know, that's the appendix is the I want to go into that, but that's your beautiful bomb testing mechanism. So that I put it so that people can uh, uh, learn about it without buying my book. Read this book, read this note, read Bell's book, and keep in mind too. Read Bell's book. Bell's book is very interesting. We'll get back to Bell tomorrow, of course.
that there is something naive about it. I mean, just like the way you seem to attribute the wave function a meaning which it does not have. It has no meaning in the world. It doesn't represent anything in the world. It represents something in laboratories. That has been emphasized over and over again in every quantum mechanics textbook. What happens if you look at quantum mechanics textbook? They give you the Hamiltonian, the wave function, blah, blah, blah. And then what does it mean? Ah, when you measure an operator, then you look at that I said in my first slide this morning, you decompose into you know, eigenvectors, and then the probability of finding an eigenvalues, blah, blah, blah. And then we all agree on that. The Born rule is explained by, by is a consequence of the boy bond theory. But it's completely, the theory applies only to those measurements. That's very strange. I mean, what happened before the whole humans? Yeah. Uh, why the Boolean mechanic cannot be tested with the max parameter? Uh, since the trajectories don't cross the middle line, why you can't put a transparent glass at the middle and then see if the particles go through? No, because if you do, then you will affect the trajectory. You see, because every interaction with the measuring device, you, in order for us to perceive something, you must interact with the macroscopic body. And that's what I explained this morning. If you have any interaction with a system with many particles will affect the wave function of your system. Yes, but you can predict how it will affect the frequency. No, you can predict, but you can't test You can't test that. You see, either you believe the theory and then you believe that the particle, let's say in the double state that goes ends up on the upper part of the screen, goes to the upper state or the lower state, or you know the bouncing back in the delayed choice, choice experiment, etc. But you can believe the theory, but you can't test that because if you really check to which hole it goes to, then you destroy the interference factor. <coughs> but it's very natural. You see, there couldn't be anything more natural than, and in fact, that's how quantum mechanics is sold to students, is that if you take a big object and you interact with a small object, namely a single particle, then of course you're going to perturb the small particle. But how do you do it? That's described in the De Boyle problem. It's not described in the quantum mechanics, but it's just a few. Just an answer. I just wanted to comment and, and add to what you said about the groups. So for me, it seems essential to say that maybe that, that there are essentially also more positions or groups, let's say positions. Um, so as you said, you can have the, the realistic approach. People who want to have, in this sense, an explanation of physics. But as you said, I agree there are people who say, who don't care or are naive realists, as you said, I agree. But I guess it's important to acknowledge that at least there is a, another position of people who embrace uh, a non-realism in some sense consistently and say, you know, I, I, I now just think of quantum mechanics not as a, I try to somehow change the definition or maybe in, in your sense of what physics should do. And now I, I don't consider quantum mechanics to be a theory of reality. And I mean, this is another a different position. You might call it extreme. I agree. You, you get also to extreme, to extreme position, but it's still consistent. So it's sure. just not naive. Sure, sure, sure. 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 Is it uh, Copenhagen? No, no, but wait yeah. a second. Wait a second. No, it could be cubism or something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So Copenhagen is a complicated, inhomogeneous thing. Well, I mean, it can be cubism. Cubism. Yeah. It's sort of just saying that what you are caring about is to predict your future sensations and then you use quantum mechanics to predict your future impression. But you see, the problem is that there used to be, okay, there are several replies to that. One is that you can do that if you want, but then there used to be something called physics which was common to Newton and Boltzmann and Einstein and, so on, and, and many others which was trying to understand what the world is like. I think ordinary physicists are not cubists at all. In fact, I don't think they're anti-realists. They speak. You see, physicists and many philosophers confuse what I would call epistemology and ontology. They would confuse the fact that you don't know something, which is epistemological, and the fact that there is no fact of the matter in the world about what's going on, which is ontological statement. So you could say, I mean, you could you know, corner a physicist and then he would say, well, the particle goes to one hole and I don't know which one. Well, both holes are open. And that's fine, that's both. But usually they would say, no, no, it goes to both holes. And then you corner them and say, well, we don't know to which hole it went. 
So we say both, when to both hold. That's reaching from epistemology to ontology. One statement about the world and the other is about what we know. These are different things. You have always to keep these things very, very separate. The whole idealistic tradition in philosophy, to me, comes from the confusion of ontology and epistemology. But it's so, a voluntary confusion. For what? It's a voluntary confusion. They are conscious that they made it. Yeah, and no. they well, it depends which one. For example, Schrodinger, um, which was a physicist, not a philosopher, he thought that uh, the, these two must be the same because the only thing that's real is mine. So it's it's logical. Yeah. It's just not what you, you think and not what I think, but it's logical. No, no, but people can be idealists without thinking there is something mine. You see, that's, it's, okay, let's not go into a too much philosophical discussion because I'm talking about ordinary physicists, and I think ordinary physicists are not idealists, they're realists. There are usually two realists, I will explain in my last talk why there are usually two they attribute, they are naive realists about operators, which is different from what you say. That's because they think when you measure something, you measure something. And they get very confused about that. They just, the point is they don't care. I mean, they, it's not the part of their job. Their job is to publish papers. That's how they get uh, advancements and jobs and careers and so on. And uh, nobody sits down to think about it. And that's, I think, very, very sad about the situation in physics. But that's, I think, the main problem. It's not that people are really uh, full-fledged argument against Bohm or that they are published or they are many world of No, They just don't. Uh, they are, it's not even true that they are Copenhagen. Put in a corner, they say, well, Bohm has straightened it. Read more. And it's very interesting, by the way, I was wanting to make that remark. Nobody reads Bell, but Bell is very clear. Then people think they have understood Bohr, which is very, which is very unclear. In fact, people who read Bohr admit that it's very unclear. The people then who don't read either Bohr or Bell think they are guilty of Bohr and not read Bell, which is very strange. I'm sure we could continue this discussion for a very long time, but at some point we'll have to. I'm dead. I'm dead. So let's end it here.